Good morning and uh, welcome to this morning's uh, hearing on the National Windstorm Impact Reduction Program, uh, Strengthening Windstorm Hazard Mitigation. This is a very, very important topic. Uh, the nation has learned that and I have learned that um, uh, in, our, uh, in my own congressional district. Uh, every single year, uh, severe winds from hurricanes, tornadoes, and thunderstorms damage or destroy thousands of homes, businesses, they damage uh, vital infrastructure, and most importantly, they threaten uh, human life. On average, on average, 60 Americans die in tornadoes each year, but in this year uh, is already proving to be one of the deadliest years on record uh, with, uh, for wind-related fatalities with over 100 Americans killed in tornadoes this spring alone. And we cannot forget uh, more than 1,000 people who lost their lives uh, in Hurricane Katrina and the follow-on uh, consequences. Dollar amounts vary widely on the extent of property damage and economic losses from windstorms, but since 2004, um, windstorms have cost this country well over $160 billion. We in the Pacific Northwest were reminded last December that mo no part of the country is safe from severe windstorms. On December 1, 2007, a Pacific storm brought hurricane force winds and heavy rain to Oregon and Washington, and tragically, five people died in that storm. Thousands were left with damaged homes, um, flattened communication systems and electrical grids, uh, insurance claims for uh, Oregon alone uh, for non-flood related damage in that windstorm were over $70 million and local and state officials have sought $53 million in federal money to help repair damaged infrastructure. Knowing that these types of storms will strike again, we must do more to prevent the loss of life and property. Today, we will discuss the National Windstorm Impact Reduction Program, or NWIRP. It was created by Congress in 2004 to help reduce devastating losses from windstorms. NWIRP directs four federal agencies, FEMA, NOAA, the National Science Foundation, and NIST, to conduct coordinated R&D on the nature of windstorms, their effects, and on ways to mitigate impact. The program also calls on these agencies to facilitate technology transfer to make sure that beneficial research is put into practice. Since passage of the enacting legislation, the program has done, quite frankly, little to address this very substantial problem. Unfortunately, NWIRP has received little attention from the administration in terms of either funding or coordination. NWIRP expires this fiscal year, and if we are to reauthorize it, we will need to discuss how it can be changed to ensure that it meets its goals of improving the safety of Americans by increasing protection from wind hazards. Damage from storms is projected to increase as a greater number of Americans move to coastal areas, and especially those areas which are subject to uh, violent windstorms. We are not completely powerless to reduce losses from windstorms. Known mitigation techniques can greatly decrease the amount of wind damage, in some cases by as much as 50 or 60 percent. I look forward to our witnesses' comments on improving the National Windstorm Impact Reduction Program, and I also hope they can suggest how we can improve the utilization of existing windstorm mitigation technologies and practices. And at this point, I'd like to recognize the subcommittee's ranking member, Dr. Gingrey, for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And before I start my opening statement, I want to ask that uh, Dr. Tim Reinhold's testimony be added, his written testimony, to the record. He was uh, uh, delayed, detained, uh, snowed in. I don't know what the the situation is in Chicago, rainstorms more likely, but was not able to get here. So if by unanimous consent, we can add his, rec his testimony to the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. I want to thank uh, you, of course, for calling this hearing on an issue that unfortunately touches the lives 
of the American people on an annual basis, damage and economic loss from windstorms. Each year, lives are lost and billions and billions of dollars are spent recovering from the destruction caused by tornadoes and hurricanes. When the National Windstorm Impact Reduction Act was passed four years ago, the federal government recognized the need to proactively conduct research and development programs to save lives and reduce property damage caused by these horrific storms. I am looking forward to hearing from today's panel about both the success of the National Windstorm Impact Reduction Program over the past four years, as well as improvements, as the Chairman said, to the program that can be made as we move forward. Mr. Chairman, my home state of Georgia uh, has had uh, a long and notorious history with tornadoes and windstorms with several incidents in the past year. In fact, uh, in March of 2007, uh, a tornado struck the towns of Potterville, North Newton, and Americas, Georgia, leaving nine people dead and tremendous damage in their wakes. In December, in Ashburn, a truck driver was killed when a tornado blew his vehicle off the road. This past March, many of you may have read about this on the sports pages, but downtown Atlanta witnessed incredible damage to infrastructure when tornadoes ripped holes in the roof of the Georgia Dome during the 2008 men's uh, SEC men's basketball tournament. Uh, it's amazing, amazing that we didn't have a tremendous loss of life because all of those people were slow to evacuate and uh, uh, to, to stop the game. They were all interested in watching. At the same time, in my northwest uh, Georgia district, the 11th of Georgia, a uh, tornado struck Polk and Floyd counties causing significant economic loss and re regrettably taking the lives of uh, two of my constituents, one in Floyd County, one in Polk County, Bonnie Turner, Jerry Albers, uh, salt of the earth people, farming community, their home was destroyed, but uh, sadly they lost their lives as well. Uh, in addition to the lives lost, the United States sustains billions of dollars in economic damages each year due to tornadoes and hurricanes and our vulnerability is only increasing, it would seem. According to the Georgia Insurance Commissioner, insured losses across our state in just the first five months of this year have surpassed $400 million. Mr. Chairman, improved windstorm impact reduction measures have the potential to save lives and reduce losses associated with these storms. For instance, the federal government continues to invest in R&D activities that can increase warning time for tor tornadoes and any other extreme weather events. While little can be done, as you said, to protect structures from large tornadoes, researchers have made significant progress in designing buildings and retrofits to withstand high wind events. Finding practical and effective applications for this research remains the biggest challenge that the National Windstorm Impact Program has today. This obstacle is unfortunately complicated by the number of stakeholders the uh, chairman mentioned the four agencies, federal agencies, state and local communities, private organizations, all have a role in better preparing the nation against windstorms. The R&D efforts in this program create ways for these stakeholders to collaborate in a productive and an effective manner. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank these three witnesses and the fourth that was not able to be here uh, through no fault of his own uh, for coming to relate their expertise on the challenges and hopefully the successes of reducing windstorm impacts. This is a complex challenge, clear benefits that will require a great deal of cooperation, patience, and resolve to overcome. And I certainly look forward to supporting these efforts and I yield back to you. I thank the gentleman. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. And I'd now like to introduce um, our witnesses and thank them for appearing before the subcommittee uh, this morning. Dr. Sharon Hayes, who is the Associate Director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, Dr. Mark Levitan, who is the Director of the Louisiana State University Hurricane Center, where he is also a Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Ms. Leslie Chapman Henderson, who is the President of the Federal Alliance for Safe Homes, or FLASH, a not-for-profit organization devoted to mitigating the impact of storms uh, on homes. Uh, Dr. Timothy Reinhold, uh, we understand, is delayed by the vagaries of either weather or the airlines, uh, which are, uh, uh, well, no further comment on either one. 
uh, and uh, his uh, uh, his uh, statement, uh, as uh, earlier referred to, will be um, included in our record. Uh, for our witnesses, uh, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each, after which the members of the committee will have five minutes to ask questions. Uh, your written statements uh, will be taken into the record in their entirety. And Dr. Hayes, uh, we will begin with you. Uh, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Wu, Ranking Member Gingry, and members of the subcommittee, it is my pleasure to appear before you in this hearing on, na on the National Windstorm Impact Reduction Program. Every year in the U.S., windstorms are responsible for tremendous damage to property and often loss of life. Hurricane Katrina demonstrated how a severe hurricane can affect not just those in its path, but the entire country and its economy. Tornadoes and severe storms are also capable of tremendous destruction. As the chairman mentioned, in 2008, the United States has been ravaged by a near record number of tornadoes that has pushed the death toll to a 10-year high. Thus, the topic of this hearing is both important and timely. You asked me to address four questions. My written testimony provides more detail regarding several of your questions, including a summary of the activities of the National Windstorm Impact Reduction Program, which was the subject of your first question. So I will not repeat that summary here. You also asked how the agencies involved in the Windstorm Impact Reduction Program receive input from the external community. This happens in a number of ways. A primary mechanism is through the National Research Council's Disasters Roundtable, which holds workshops on particular disaster-related topics that bring together experts from agencies, industry, academia, and non-governmental organizations. Several agency personnel sit on the Roundtable Steering Committee. Many others participate in the Roundtables themselves. A list of recent Roundtable topics can be found in Attachment 3 to my written. Another extremely important mechanism for getting non-government input on disaster-related R&D occurs through agency-specific mechanisms. Here are several examples. One, NSF incorporates private sector researchers, particularly those in academia, on its peer review panels charged with helping make award selection decisions. Two, through active participation and leadership in many standards development organizations, staff from NIST's Building and Fire Research Laboratory, which is the locus of NIST's windstorm-related research, contribute significant time and technical expertise to the process of developing national and international this brings them into direct contact with their peers in the private sector and also helps translate the results of NIST research into practical application. Three, because some important disaster-related research can be done only in the aftermath of an event, FEMA assembles mitigation assessment teams made up of government and private sector experts to perform post-disaster assessments. These teams work closely together to understand the impacts of a disaster event on building their results are of tremendous importance in defining new areas of research, as well as future building codes and standards. These examples reflect the different missions and operations of the agencies that perform disaster R&D. They provide multiple and complementary avenues for public-private communication. You also asked for an update on efforts being taken to address current gaps in R&D identified in the administration's windstorm impact reduction implementation Descriptions of specific agency activities and programs are included in my written testimony. In addition, the Windstorm Working Group will also be providing Congress with an updated biennial report by later this year or early next year. That report will have more information on the Working Group's most recent activities. Finally, you asked about a 2003 RAND report on Windstorm. The RAND report represents a very thoughtful assessment of the role of R&D in helping make our nation more resilient to disasters. In fact, it was one of the guiding references used by the Subcommittee on Disaster Reduction, which is the interagency group that's charged with coordinating the administration's disaster-related R&D when developing their report on grand challenges for disaster. Many of the issues raised in the RAND report are specifically identified in the grand challenges, such as an emphasis on mitigation strategies and technology. One of the RAND report's implicit conclusions is the importance of considering disaster reduction R&D in an all-hazards context, thus taking into account windstorm R&D alongside other disasters, such as floods, earthquakes, and wildfires. That all-hazards context is a fundamental tenet of the federal government's current approach to coordination of disaster 
closing, I'd like to point out that in many instances, reducing the impacts of disasters ultimately requires actions beyond the purview of the federal government. The adoption of zoning laws, building codes, and other actions that can build resilience within communities are rightly vested in state and local authorities. Given this, I believe the most important roles of the federal government are in R&D that underpin technological innovations, such as improved prediction capabilities and better strengthened buildings and and in communicating the benefits of their adoption. The Subcommittee on Disaster Reduction is an important mechanism for the federal government to perform these essential elements of developing a more disaster. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer any questions that you or other members of the subcommittee have at the appropriate time. And as I mentioned earlier, my written testimony contains much more detail, so I ask that it and its attachments be made part of the Thank you, Dr. Hayes. Dr. Levitan, please proceed. Good morning. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, discuss with you today um, on uh, impacts. I was asked to uh, provide some input on uh, several questions addressing the vulnerability of the built environment and how that's changing uh, research needs and windstorm hazard mitigation, uh, recommended changes in the uh, wind program and technology transfer challenges. And um, uh, as uh, uh, mentioned in the uh, uh, opening statements, were were uh, this year has already proven to be one of the deadliest uh, tornado seasons in uh, recent years. Certainly, uh, our, our hurricane experience, uh, as we're uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, as we've seen in just uh, uh, in just the past few years. Um, Seven of the 13 costliest uh, hurricanes uh, in, in U.S. history have occurred in just the past few years, and, and that trend is continuing as the population continues to, to move to coastal areas, as the increasing urbanization uh, occurs. And so those trends uh, at the moment, while there is some positive developments going on, those trends for, for increased damage are, are, are uh, unfortunately continuing. The, um, in terms of uh, research needs, I uh, point out, uh, I think, what are several key opportunities for uh, making step change improvements in terms of some of the longer term uh, activities, the understanding the wind uh, environment of landfalling hurricanes. As we have uh, Hurricane uh, Dolly today making landfall in Texas, some of my colleagues from Texas Tech University are out uh, with uh, instruments uh, similar to those pictured uh, uh, on the slide making measurements of windstorms. We really don't understand what happens in the wind environment uh, down near the ground level when the storms make landfall. And that's obviously where it affects buildings and, and bridges and people and things. So that's what we, we need to understand that. Computational wind engineering is an area that uh, needs study that provides the idea you ultimately could get a wind tunnel on, on your desktop, a virtual wind tunnel, where you can take use new technology to uh, study the effects of the wind for in the design sense on, on the building uh, without having to do the, 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 the complexities of wind tunnel testing or the simplifications required by codes. Uh, windstorm damage using remote sensing. In the last few years, as remote sensing capabilities have improved uh, for commercially available, where you can uh, very clearly see individual buildings and the roof, uh, et cetera, that provides an, enough level of information where we could potentially get very rapid and, and automated damage assessments over large scales when we have these major disasters. Uh, Performance-based design for uh, windstorm. That's the uh, a, a technology uh, in its infancy where building owners and, and architects and engineers would sit down at the beginning of a project and say, what is the specific performance objectives for a building and how would I reach that? So if I wanted a building to have no damage at all in a category three hurricane and on or a category four or five, it could sustain some damage but still be operable or repairable. The idea is you would um, set the design criteria so that you'd have a specific performance in mind for various objectives and that technology is just in its um, uh, inf infancy. And finally, retrofit technologies for the um, uh, ex existing buildings since that's what we have so much, uh, all building code changes and advances in the technology for new construction uh, are, are wonderful, but we have this, uh, so much investment in our, in our existing infrastructure, so significant changes are needed there. In terms of the research priorities, um, there's a large existing body of knowledge, and uh, it has yet to, it, 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 much of it has not been incorporated into building codes and standards. And so the uh, um, initial prioritization, I believe, should be to 
focus in the first few years more on applied research and tech transfer for the work that's already out there, and then transitioning into more uh, uh, f funding later on into more of the basic research ideas that I just method. In terms of the changes to the uh, WIND program, it, uh, I think uh, it would be appropriate for NIST to become the uh, lead agency. They have parallels to the, the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program, which they're leading in significant expertise and experience in windstorm mitigation and certainly to uh, finally form the, the interagency working group and in terms of funding authorizations to at, uh, levels to at least con, uh, keep those consistent with the authorization levels in the existing program. In terms of the technology uh, transfer challenges, uh, several of these are to use the existing research to develop new methods for, for assessment and design of buildings. The two uh, next two highlighted in red there, incorporating research into building codes and standards and developing uh, design guides and software tools. Those, I think, are the real opportunities for very rapid uh, uh, improvements um, right, right now with a small investment um, in, in technology transfer to use the existing research to Im improve the building codes very quickly. Uh, developing textbooks and curricular material for instructors. Uh, incorporating um, wind mitigation into curricula. So some of these challenges on, on the, this slide uh, uh, indicate some that are not particularly only dependent on funding, but they have several other um, criteria in terms of education and training of construction and tradespeople. Adoption and enforcement of codes is, is a critical challenge, which only, again, partly dependent on funding. And then education and training in a broader sense are, are um, critical for the, 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 the public. So with the closing remarks, I would just say that the windstorm impacts on the U.S. are continuing to increase. And the, the, the wind program is really the best opportunity to provide a, a change in that trend and, and has, it really has the op op opportunity to provide a step change increase in the uh, hazard mitigation opportunities. And it really, the, the coordination activities between the various efforts that are even underway are, are really a way to multiply the effectiveness of the existing and new activities. So reauthorization, I think, is a critical step forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levitan. Ms. Chapman Henderson, uh, please proceed. Ms. Alliance for Safe Homes. We are a partnership of more than 100 public, private, and nonprofit organizations and leaders who have dedicated the past 10 years to making America a more disaster resistant nation. Our mission is to strengthen homes and safeguard families from disasters of all kinds, including earthquakes, floods, hail, hurricane lightning, tornadoes, and wildfire. We view our work as part of a larger social movement to establish disaster safety as a public value in this country. Our goal is to create widespread homeowner demand for safer, better built homes, much like the highway safety movement, which succeeded in creating American demand for safe, well-built vehicles. Just as the highway safety movement has saved lives on our roads, the disaster safety movement can and does save lives, homes, and buildings in catastrophic events. We do believe that the United States built environment is highly vulnerable to windstorm hazards and that is increasing. We perceive that the greatest challenge in strengthening newer existing buildings is a lack of information and a lack of knowledge transfer between the many stakeholders that need to understand windstorm prevention options. After hurricanes and tornadoes, we frequently meet homeowners who are very frustrated to learn that a mere handful of additional nails may have made a difference in keeping their roof in place. We believe that one of the best means of solving this problem is to put in place a system of state-of-the-art, consistently enforced model building codes that incorporate all research findings on a timely basis, but these have to be put in place before windstorms strike. This would overcome the often lost opportunity to rebuild damaged communities in a stronger way because improving codes after the storm can happen too late to affect the quality of the new built environment. If we rebuild without the advantage of new techniques and mitigation, we perpetuate a cycle of build, destroy, rebuild that our organization and movement is working to break. We have found that effective mechanisms for convincing stakeholders to adopt wind mitigation measures include a combination of public awareness, market demand, innovative mitigation programs, model codes, professional education, and of course research. Two innovative model programs are the My Safe Florida Home and South Carolina Safe Home Initiatives. These programs provide wind mitigation, home inspections, and matching grants for home hardening and retrofitting. These efforts help homeowners understand the relative strengths and weaknesses of their homes by assigning a ranking on a 1 to 100 scale. They then provide matching funds to help offset the cost of retrofitting or hardening. 
Understanding and communicating the linkage between strong buildings and sound economics is a powerful public motivator as well. Let's take Texas, for example, in light of what's happened there in the last 48 hours. Catastrophe models tell us that the average annual expected insured losses from hurricanes for single-family homes in Texas are approximately $932 million per year, or nearly a billion dollars. If we could retrofit the entire stock of homes there using modern building codes, that loss expectation would drop by 40% to $562 million. Moreover, if we rebuilt the entire housing stock to a slightly code plus standard, that annual expected loss would drop 78% to $206 million per year. Another key area of improvement in building practices that we support, of course, is to increase funding for research and innovation. We need to better understand how and why buildings survive or fail in windstorms, and our ac academic partners still do not have all the answers. We believe that FEMA and the National Weather Service do an excellent job of communicating the importance of mitigation as a priority. However, by its nature, the information has to be delivered at the state and especially at the local level. We strongly urge you. Uh, we strongly support the National Windstorm Impact Reduction Program and strongly encourage the reauthorization with investment of additional resources. We believe the three most important areas to emphasize include activities to enhance the understanding of windstorms through research, development of improved outreach and implementation mechanisms, and outreach and information dissemination related to cost-effective and affordable construction techniques to all audiences. With regard to implementation, we believe that the program should establish a singular guiding principle to ensure that program outcomes and discoveries are widely shared with the general public. I want to thank you for the opportunity to join you today for all you are doing to help protect Americans from the devastating effects of windstorms and for helping homeowners in this country understand that luck should not be their first line of defense when they confront natural disaster threats. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Ms. Chapman Henderson. Um, we come to the uh, questions and answers uh, a portion of this hearing. And uh, at this point, uh, we open for our first round of questions. And uh, I recognize myself uh, for an opening five minutes. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Levitan and Ms. Chapman Henderson uh, to uh, uh, help characterize the um, uh, the OSTP and the general federal implementation of the National Windstorm Impact uh, Reduction Program. Uh, how have uh, how has the OSTP and uh, how have the agencies done thus far, and uh, what needs to be worked on to uh, uh, improve this program going forward? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I think, uh, and, and uh, as you pointed out in your opening statement, um, there's been uh, progress has been limited, uh, and uh, much of that has uh, has to do with the with, with the funding issue, um, and the the agencies uh, each have their, their their own tasks, and and have reported that they're they're working on wind hazard various wind hazard mitigation um, programs, but. At least from my perspective, uh, and where I can see that the again the coordination activities so far have been somewhat limited, uh, and, and perhaps that the, the nature of the, of the problem is is the funding restrictions. Uh, when, when you say somewhat limited, are you being polite about that? Yes. Well, I, also, I, again, my nature uh, uh, and from from where I sit, and I, uh, I'm I'm uh, somewhat on the outside of of, of those activities, and uh, and I uh, w the information that I get oftentimes is. Uh, um, you know, for, from reports or whatever, I'm not here in Washington to attend all the meetings. Uh. Ms. Chapman Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think one of the most valuable activities we've participated in, probably the, the main activity, is participating in the post-disaster investigations and the willingness of FEMA to coordinate those and bring us in so that we can speed that information to the consumers has been incredible. In 2004, we participated and 2005. In fact, we're looking at possibly joining a Midwest flooding um, investigation team that's going to go out. Because so often, I think our greatest challenge is the time it takes to take in the information, putting it into the building code cycle, which is more than three years, at, you know, frequently. The, the storms aren't going to wait. 
And that's one of the greatest challenges here is we have to possibly speed up the sharing of information and get it to, you know, into either the codes or on a market basis to homeowners so they can make those choices ahead of time. Well, Ms. Chapman Henderson, d during your t uh, testimony, you mentioned that uh, it's important to get out ahead of the cycle uh, so that uh, the FEMA advice doesn't come so late that the building codes are changed and we get into a cycle of build, destroy, destroy. rebuild, destroy. Uh, ha have we been shortening that cycle or, or is that still a problem? It's still a problem. Um, and one of the biggest challenges there is while the model codes are being developed incorporating new learning and science and innovation, it's, it's still a very slow and arduous process. But those model codes are adopted at the state level. They still have to carry through and be adopted at the local level. And we have issues across the country where at the local level, when the model codes are adopted, adverse measures, chapters, amendments, and essentially sometimes removing the engineering behind the wind science are put in place. And the net effect is a, is a weakening of the code that, that's put there. So it not only takes a long time to get the new codes, but it, it's important to preserve the quality of the model code when it gets all the way down to the homeowner. That doesn't happen today. Let me circle back in a different period of questioning about um, the federal role in helping disseminate that information and uh, getting it all the way to the ground level. Uh, Dr. Hayes, I, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the concerns that I expressed and I think some of our other witnesses expressed about the level of activity uh, that OSTP and the other agencies have engaged in, the level of coordination. Uh, it is my understanding that the administration has simply not asked for uh, it, it, uh, any adequate level uh, of funding uh, for this particular program. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, addressing a couple of questions, I think, that you have on, on coordination, funding, um, et cetera. <clears throat> with respect to funding, obviously, um, funding decisions are made um, within the different agencies that participate in the program. Uh, as, as you know, as this committee well knows, um, those agencies face um, significant challenges in prioritizing different areas of research. So not just windstorm research um, related to other kinds of hazards research, but all hazards research related to, to everything else within their domain. So, um, I, I think the, the agencies have developed budgets that, so, that they so, since feel. Since my time is running out, uh, what I hear, hear you going toward is that this, uh, this set of efforts simply has not come to the top of the priority list or close enough to the top of the priority list thus far. I think agencies have, have placed a, a high priority on this research. I think it's important to, um, when we're talking about measuring coordination, which is a very abstract thing to measure, I tend to think in terms of measuring results and keeping in mind that this program, while it's only been authorized for several years, um, that these programs within the agencies have existed for many years, um, I think there's a number of demonstrable results that have been achieved in terms of windstorm, windstorm um, R&D. Um, track forecast accuracy has been improved by 50 percent. That's led to um, what used to be only three-day forecasts. We now have five-day out forecasts that are as accurate as the three-day out forecasts. Um, the hurricane warning areas have shrunk. Those have profound implications not just for loss of life, but also for economic implications associated with evacuations and so forth. Um, similar increases in tornado warning um, research that's led to increased warning times for tornadoes from six minutes to 11 minutes just between 1994 and 2002. So I think there's a lot of, of things that we can point to that have been very positive um, and, um, and, and, and that the agencies involved in this program are, are largely responsible for, through their research. Well, thank you, Dr. Hayes. My time has expired, but I just want to point out that some of this National Weather Service, uh, some of these meteorological capabilities are outside of this particular program. I'm concerned about some of the building code issues and some of the existing technology transfer issues that apparently have not been uh, performed, and it's been raised by some of the uh, written and oral testimony of the, of the other witnesses. But we'll circle back on that. And at this point, I'd like to recognize uh, Dr. Gingrey uh, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I'm sure some of our questions will overlap to some extent, but I did want to ask all witnesses, let's end with Dr. Hayes and start with Ms. Chapman Henderson. 
uh, how would you characterize uh, the level of cooperation between the different federal agencies that are currently engaged in windstorm research? Uh, I want to know if you have any specific suggestions that would improve your institution's interaction with the interagency research efforts as they currently exist. I know there's funding problems. Dr. Levithan and others have mentioned that, uh, and, and that's a problem, of course. But do you think the R&D focus of each agency is appropriate, and, and are, are they uh, trying to cooperate uh, for, and make this program better? Well, I don't. I don't want to opine on things I don't have specific knowledge of, and I only, we work mostly with the National Weather Service on public education efforts, and of course FEMA on mitigation, so I haven't had a lot of experience with the other agencies that had a role in coordination here. But I think the, the measure of all of this is what, which, or of, if any of the outcomes make it into use either through the building codes or through market-based knowledge that can be incorporated. And I, I think that there's been some tremendous progress, as was mentioned, on forecasting at the Weather Service evacuation times, you know, have been, um, and, and that's critical. But I think because there's progress there, maybe it's time to start looking and maybe create more consistency when we're talking about the fundamental failure or survival of the structures. And I don't think right. we've, we've drilled into it that much yet. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chapman Henderson. I, I think I'll go directly to Dr. Hayes now and then let Dr. Levithan give a follow-up comment. Uh, thank you. The, the, the issue of coordination is, is one that I've thought a lot about with respect to this, this working group. Um, because, frankly, this working group has faced some challenges, I think, in, in generating um, the same level of interest and engagement that we see with some of the other interagency working groups um, that OSTP helps coordinate. And I think a, a, an obvious um, comparison to make is between the WIND um, interagency working group and the Subcommittee on Disaster Reduction, which I mentioned in my opening statement and is the all-hazards approach to um, interagency inter coordination. Um, I, one of the things that, that strikes me as a, as a key difference between those two groups is the all-hazards approach. And so the, the Subcommittee on Disaster Reduction in taking that approach, I think that that provides tremendous impetus for agencies to come to the table to make sure that the different types of hazards-related research are represented there and so forth. The very, uh, very narrow, really, slice of the, the overall R&D picture that's represented by windstorm-related um, research um, presents a challenge there, I think. Um, it's been mentioned by, by one of the other witnesses that the agencies in, with respect to windstorm research have very defined um, activities, and I think that's appropriate. They are in, um, complementary. Um, each agency undertakes those activities very much in keeping with, with their other types of activities. So the National Science Foundation um, does, um, uh, has a very different approach to funding windstorm-related research than, say, FEMA. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I think that that is something, um, and, and Mr. Gingrey, I hope that this committee will consider um, whether or not it makes sense to treat individual um, types of hazards in this way that we have been versus the, the all-hazards approach, which I think is supported um, not only by our success with the Subcommittee on Disaster Reduction, but in things like the RAND report and, and other approaches. Dr. Levithan. Um, so I, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I think uh, that uh, the, the individual agencies uh, have... Uh, uh, done uh, what what they can within their within their resources and uh, are making s a significant progress. But the the program is really provides them the opportunity and and hopefully to, in the future to do a, a better job and enhance their coordination. And uh, I, th I think that's why we really need to to move forward with with uh, uh, with this and and expand the the, and the, the interagency working group into. Uh, pro provide uh, for, for better coordination. Mr. Chairman, as my time in this first round is winding down, I want to ask unanimous consent if any of the members uh, want to submit questions for the record for Dr. Reinhold, uh, if that would be allowed. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Dr. Ehlers for five minutes. 
Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Unfortunately, I have three hearings going on simultaneously, so I missed the testimony and early questioning. And if I ask a question that has already been asked, uh, just let me know, and I'll withdraw it. But I, just following up on a comment I made at a hearing a week or two ago, it, it's real puzzle to me as someone who lives in the frozen north and has also lived in earthquake-prone California. Uh, we have adopted building codes in those areas which work extremely well. Uh, I have never heard of in any time recently that a house has collapsed because of heavy snow on the roof in our area. And the earthquake damage has really been minimized in earthquakes by the strong building codes out west. Uh, it's always puzzled me why we haven't taken the same care and rigor in, in the hurricane-prone areas. Uh, we know that we can mitigate a lot of the damage, prevent a lot of the damage uh, by appropriate building codes, and it just doesn't seem to happen. And I'm curious if you can give me any insight as to why this, this slow rate of adoption of improved building codes in areas that are prone to windstorms. Anyone have any wisdom to offer on that issue? Certainly try. I think there are those in the construction profession that are fearful of the cost. And some of those fears are, are accurate. I mean, that the cost of constructing a home is, is an essential component of whether or not people can have a home. So there's, I, I think this is where information and knowledge transfer comes in. If we can um, complete the research and identify, perfect those affordable techniques, and then communicate, you know, we're, we're talking about incremental increases in cost that make a difference between surviving a windstorm or not, I think we go a long way. There is a, perhaps a fear of the unknown tied up in the conclusion ahead of time that it's going to make homes too expensive. For our part, we've always felt that the, the home that was built in a way that allowed it to fail was the ultimate expensive home. So it just didn't make any sense to us. And I think that's um, pretty much the core of what we do. But there is there's some opposition in the field. There's been talk also of, again, looking back at highway safety, of finding a way to reward those states and um, municipalities that do embrace intact the national model codes. and possibly providing a carrot of sorts so that there's some enhanced mitigation money pre-disaster or other initiatives that could um, help motivate the communities to recognize that um, they have to do their part too. Yeah, I, but, you know, I've served in local government too. In every change you make, there are people complaining about the expense, uh, sometimes legitimately. But we still increase the building code or change the building code to accommodate that. Uh, California has probably had the greatest expense. Uh, the, the occurrence of earthquakes is very unlikely, and yet we have very good building codes which make minimize the damage. If you add up the cost of all those changes in the building code, uh, it's hard to justify on the basis of any individual residence, but uh, in terms of the overall picture and lives saved, it's a good investment. Uh, why, why have the protesters against wind damage building codes been so either so strident or so successful, whereas it's not been an issue in other areas? Uh, every time you change the building code, you get screams of anguish, uh, but you still do it because if it's the right thing to do. Well, two points. One is I couldn't agree with you more. It is the right thing to do, and that's again, the core of what we do. I think one of the challenges is it can be very technical. I'll give you an example. There's a um, provision that is often used at the local level when um, the residential code is adopted relating to windstorm. And by its insertion, it um, makes a requirement for having shutters or opening protection unnecessary. And the um, insertion is allows people to have an option. Instead of shuttering a home at the time of construction, you could do something called design it to be um, partially enclosed or f design it for internal pressurization, which sounds really good. It, and it does, in fact, make the structure stronger. But the, the interesting thing to us is that the designing for internal pressurization option 
my understanding is it was originally put in place for barns because barns don't really need shutters. Um, if a storm is coming, the concept is you probably get your horses or other uh, animals out of the way, so that caused an undue expense to the farmer. But putting something in place that allows homes to be designed and built that way essentially leaves those homeowners without the ability to shelter in place because they won't have opening protection and, and as critical as roof performance is in high wind, um, covering your windows is a pretty well established um, factor as well. But it's so technical and it's hard to understand and it's, it's engineering. I think sometimes we don't understand what's being done. Well, I'm, I have to admit, I, I'm uh, dismayed and also amused every time there's a hurricane pending. TV shows all the people running down to Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever, buying cardboard, hammering it over their windows, which, of course, creates damage to the, the woodwork and so forth, and is really quite an expensive option. Uh, I can't believe that doing that on a regular basis is any cheaper than building it right in the first place. Or is, I'm sorry, it's any more expensive than building it right in the first place. I couldn't agree more yeah. when you add the social costs as, as well. Yeah. Any other comments, Dr. Ludvin? Lud uh, yes, um, I'll, I'll address more, maybe more the, the technical side of your question. I think the, 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 the adoption of, of the codes has, has been addressed. One, uh, the, actually, there, there, there have been, in, uh, particularly in New England in the last several years, there was some, some roof significant roof collapses for, from snow load. But the nature of snow load is a gravity load a a acting down that the, the structures typically are, are, are designed uh, fairly well for that. And where, where, earth where earthquake and, and wind loads uh, have lateral loads and uplift loads, which is more unusual and takes more care to be able to design for. The better performance of, of structures in Earthquakes, I think, has in a large part has, has been due to the success of the of the NEHRP, the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program, which has for many years gone out after the earthquakes and found out exactly what worked and what didn't, and then had the significant funding to make major advances in the in the codes. There's been dramatic changes in, in our, our design practices and technologies and techniques and products that we use for earthquakes, and to get that into the code and to move that forward. Uh, uh, whereas we have not had that same opportunity in, uh, uh, in, in wind hazard mitigation. And certainly, even the codes that we have now, they, they do, a, they do a, a good job of reducing when they're adopted and enforced, but we, we still have a long ways to go in terms of moving our codes, to, our, our building codes for, for wind to the next generation. So are you suggesting that we need more research? Uh, uh, yes, very clearly. Uh, the, the research and the technology transfer. Uh, to, to take the research findings. And we, ha we have sort of a backlog that we've built up of research findings. Uh, and w within the research community, for, and, and even internationally, we have a lot of research which has not been able to be translated into uh, codes and standards because the funding for that is very difficult to get. That's generally too applied for the National Science Foundation. And there isn't other, there, there, there typically isn't industry funding or other funding uh, opportunities available to do that tech transfer. And so the, 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 uh, the national program here w would be the, 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 the place to be able to provide that and get a lot of bang for the buck right now. Well, Mr. Chairman, I suggest you take care of that problem. <laughs> Thank you. I yield. The gentleman's comments are uh, always uh, trenchant and on point, uh, and as are his questions. And next, uh, the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, witnesses. Uh, <clears throat> coming from hail-prone, uh, tornado-prone, and various uh, situations in rural Nebraska, it, it's been interesting as disasters have struck uh, in the country in various places. My constituents watching tax dollars uh, go to certain areas of the country is one thing, but when availability of homeowners insurance becomes scarce uh, is is quite another. And so the attention is had around the country, and, and I, this is interesting discussion here. Um, and, you know, the, the uh, mitigating efforts um, on the part of uh, auto dealers, for example, building canopies so they can... Uh, by more affordable hail insurance. Uh, it's, it's been interesting. It's been expensive up front, obviously, when an automobile dealership uh, builds canopies for their entire inventory. But it's a cost savings in the long run, and certainly it's a good business decision. 
But uh, as we are discussing, uh, perhaps uh, Mrs. Chapman Henderson, on the training, how many people have been trained through the Blueprint for Safety curriculum? Um, last year, approximately 2,500. Currently focus and our work is very state specific because the training is usually part of an overall initiative embraced by a state so we're right now training inspectors in South Carolina I don't know the specific number of how many when Florida put their um, mitigation program in place there was a huge training uh, piece to that and we provided it what would you say are the skills that would be taught through a course well first the first chapter is on just fundamentals of wind design and understanding some of the basics just on roof shape and this whole concept of pressurization of the structure. You know, one of the things we used to believe, and I think a lot of consumers still believe, is that um, we should crack windows open when tornadoes are coming. And we've learned through the work of Dr. Levitan and others that wind effects on structures are such that we don't want any wind in the house. So we start with those fundamentals and we teach prescriptive methods for roof attachment with enhanced nailing, secondary water barrier, um, identifying code plus or um, impact resistant or wind resistant shingles. So have, have you seen the, the students uh, per se of the training uh, be able to enhance their employment position uh, through the coursework? Yes, in fact it's ironic because we used to worry about being able to get contractors to participate in our program because there was so much work going on with the housing boom but there has been an unintended but positive consequence of this specialty that's been created across the country called wind mitigation uh, much like the medical profession if you're an orthopedic surgeon you don't necessarily practice cardiology so a lot of contractors um, even some appraisers and others have been able to cross train into performing wind mitigation retrofits. Uh, uh, as you know, the new construction and the building codes essential for all the new construction and of course post-disaster to bring that housing stock into current times. But our greatest challenge is the existing stock and retrofitting it. So it's becoming a specialty area in the trade and in the profession. It's not vast yet, but it is um, growing and it is becoming something that I think we'll see over time will take hold because there are so many things you can do. If you can get in your attic, for example, you can put additional uh, metal connectors to enhance the connection between the roof and the wall. And that can make all the difference in a high wind event. Uh, you know, there's also the notion of the existing activities for people like roofers. If roofers are trained and cross-trained into wind mitigation, they recognize that the ideal time to enhance the strength of a roof deck is when you've taken the covering off. And that's where that handful of additional nails, maybe of a specific type, maybe you know ring shank nails, that can make the difference in um, keeping that deck on. There's a pretty famous story that um, we always talk about about Hurricane Andrew where the Miami Herald had a headline. It looked like a football score, and it said, um, habitat 24, Andrew 0. And what it was talking about is that 24 homes built by Habitat volunteers survived Hurricane Andrew nearly intact. In fact, we raced to the scene only to find out they were fine. The unfortunate part is that um, surrounding those homes, there were commercially developed homes that were decimated. So the engineers came in, they looked at, you know, the damage investigation revealed that volunteers nailing a roof deck on said typically say to themselves you know I guess if one nail is good two is even better and unwittingly enhance the nailing pattern and thereby the strength of the deck so those houses were just fine and, and, and it's those types of things that I think um, you know we need more research so we know specifically what's working and learning things like that just a handful of nails what an essential element and when you think about the economics pretty powerful but we we aren't yet in a place where everybody knows that and that homeowners know that and um, roofers all know that and I think we have an opportunity to change things by making that happen well either uh, Ms. Chapman Henderson or Dr. Levitin um, are we seeing positive patterns of consumer behavior post storm events are we, are we learning from <laughs> our mistakes? Well, I, I guess I can speak to maybe recent activity in Louisiana. Um, 
it's it's very slow. Uh, it, it's um, especially a after the, the, such a large scale event uh, like a Katrina or or, or, or Rita. Um, as important as it would seem, there's so many other um, activities like where am I going to stay and my house and my job and, and, and all of those things that it, it's kind of hard for it to get traction. Um, I, I think it, it seems that, uh, the, 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 for example, the, the state did a good job and within a few months after Katrina we passed the statewide mandatory building codes and that's been being phased in uh, and, and of course training and education of even the building inspectors and the design profession is, is a challenge. It's going to take many, many, many years. And we're, uh, I think the education of the consumer and the, getting to the point where the consumer is starting to ask for that, it's really just in its infancy. And so we're three years out from, from Katrina now and it's, I would say it's, it's, it's very slow. At least it's, it's on the right trajectory. The people are, are starting to look at it. You occasionally see, and I know it in Florida it's, it's much more common, you occasionally see a commercial on the television for hurricane shutters now that you would have, we would have never seen that before. Um, and, and there's a few developments that are, that are starting and people are starting to ask about, well, you know, um, uh, what is this uh, fortified home program? Uh, my, my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Reinhold, couldn't be here uh, today, but the IBHS has their program and they're making some, some inroads in, in Louisiana and I've heard that some builders are starting to, to, to use that one. So it's, it's a slow process, but it, it, it is, we are making some progress, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, it is the chair's intention to give uh, the gentleman from uh, California a moment to get settled, uh, and so the chair will recognize himself first uh, uh, for five minutes. Uh, Dr. Levitan, you cited the importance of future research, but that there's a, a lot of existing technology or research that's already been performed where there has not been adequate transfer of that knowledge uh, to application. And Ms. Chapman Henderson, you cited some uh, specific examples uh, perhaps of you know, you know very straightforward steps that could be taken that are also uh, in essence tech transfer uh, types of issues D dr. Levitan can you can you uh, d tell us about some of the other uh, already done research the existing technologies which have not been adequately transferred and and your ideas about how that transfer might occur better yes uh, mr. chairman um, uh, as, as an example, I, I, uh, I'm a member of the uh, ASCE 7 uh, wind load subcommittee. That's the committee that uh, writes the, the, the national wind loading standard, which gets adopted into the, into the model building codes. And we uh, are, are going through a cycle right now that the, the, the document is revised every few years. And we're, we're examining the methods that we use to determine how, how do you, what, what the provisions that go in the codes for how do you figure what the wind loads are on a building. And the discussion at the last meeting was is, the, the, the two methods that we have in the building code right now, in, in, in the ASCE standard right now, are based on 30 or 40 year old data. And in those days when you did wind tunnel, that was from, came from wind tunnel tests, and there might be uh, four or five or ten pressure taps on a building where you measure the, measure the pressures at just a very few number location of pressure on, on the building. The technology to the wind tunnel testing technology today is so far advanced where you routinely would measure pressures simultaneously over a thousand points all over the whole building so you really understand what the wind loading is happening on the whole building all at once and yet the methods that we use in the code are based on much much older technology so we have a lot of data uh, that's available out there and NIST has a, is working on a program uh, right now for what they call a database assisted design where they're slowly taking some of that that wind tunnel data and tr trying to develop a method where we can we can make somewhat use, some use of that but there's real opportunities there where there, there is so much tremendous amount of data, the wind tunnel technology has advanced so far, but most of the benefits of that have not found their way into the building code yet, and that would need some, uh, some, some additional testing with the technology that we already have to do what we call parametric studies. Look at, uh, the, the building code only has rectangular boxes. But the only kind of building, if you look in the code and see how do I figure the wind load on a building, it'll have a picture of a rectangular box of a building with maybe two or three different roof shapes, a pitched roof or a gable roof or a hip roof, but what if you have buildings in plan view that are L-shape or T-shape or have balconies or have all these other things? There is nothing in the code for that. And we have the technology to be able to do that with our advanced wind tunnel testing. It hasn't been done. Dr. Levitan, I'm sure you have many other examples. But let me uh, jump to Dr. Hayes uh, uh, for a second. And uh, Dr. Hayes, there appears to be a tech transfer problem of existing knowledge uh, to designers, builders, uh, 
drafters of building codes. Uh, what, in your view, uh, can the federal government do to promote this technology transfer? Uh, which federal agencies uh, do you see as playing a role in that? So uh, I think there's there's a couple of different answers. First of all, um, <clears throat> Dr. Ehlers, I think, hit on, on the fundamental issue here, which is, and, and other witnesses have elaborated on, elaborated on it, which is um, that we have a lot of this data. Um, it's not necessarily getting translated to those who uh, write local building codes, uh, zoning laws, et, et cetera. Um, I think that's where the primary breakdown in, in and I would argue that, that and I, Dr. Ehlers made this point, I think, very, very nicely, that um, there does seem to be something of a difference when you look at windstorms versus other kinds of hazards, such as earthquakes. Um, I, I don't know why those differences exist. That sounds to me like an area of um, social science research that is, is ripe for exploration. And I know NSF um, funds exactly those kinds of, of research questions. Um, in terms of what federal agencies are involved in the technology transfer right now, clearly NIST has a central role. Um, and as I, I mentioned before, because many NIST scientists um, both do their government-related research and then also sit on these standards development committees like the ones that ASCE and, and others run, um, they have a, a direct flow of, of information from what they know from their government research going directly into those standards building standards generating um, committee. So that, that's clearly a very important mechanism. Um, again, um, Dr. Hayes, yes. I'm going to interrupt you because my time is expiring. Uh, you mentioned NIST and Dr. Levitan. Uh, I believe in your testimony re you recommended that NIST take a leading role uh, in this program. Uh, uh, and, and I want to give you a, a chance to ex uh, expand on that and, and explain why you think NIST is an appropriate agency. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I think because they uh, they have the uh, expertise uh, and experience in, in directly in wind hazard, they have uh, folks working in, in wind hazard mitigation area. This program uh, has significant parallels to the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program, uh, which uh, they uh, are, are the lead agency for now. Uh, and so it uh, seems to be the right fit of an agency that, that that does research and does tech transfer, as opposed to, say, National Science Foundation, which would only focus on the on the research aspects. And so, from the agencies involved, NIST really seems to be the best fit. Thank you, Dr. Levitan. And at this point, I'd like to turn to Dr. Gingrey. Five minutes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I want to address this question to uh, Ms. Uh, Chapman Henderson. You know, we, uh, the federal government, we uh, a lot of times put. Uh, unfunded mandates on a lot of uh, industry. Uh, I'm thinking particularly uh, in the uh, electric uh, generation uh, industry, particularly coal-fired uh, uh, power plants and some of these uh, very old existing for uh, 20, 30, 40 years and all of a sudden uh, decisions made by the federal government because of the Clean Air Act that, that you've got to uh, retrofit to an extent that you'd almost have to uh, tear the place down or convert over to natural gas, which is much more expensive and, of course, used uh, in a lot of other industries, and we have a limited supply. I'm thinking, of course, in cities like uh, my city of Atlanta, metropolitan statistical area, which is non-attainment, and uh, people have to uh, get, have their vehicles inspected every year, every year, and a lot of times, you know, you've got senior citizens driving an eight, year old car uh, that can't really uh, meet the standards and it's an uh, unusual burden on them. Uh, so my question is uh, that the leading into the question, uh, you I know you're involved in, in a lot of state-of-the-art uh, retrofit technologies for older construction uh, in regard to uh, natural disaster mitigation, in particular wind, and certainly I, I think that's great uh, what your organization is doing in educating the public. Uh, but it's important to know, I think, for the committee uh, to, to understand the cost involved in, in retrofitting. Uh, and are, are you more more focused on on new construction? And uh, as these houses are replaced, you know, old housing stock, of course, and uh, 
uh, modernization of same, but uh, I don't think uh, it would be very cost effective to require uh, people to, you know, to by, by ordinance of the local uh, government of uh, building codes to all of a sudden have to go back in and change something that wasn't wasn't the law when they moved into their abode. Bet and and the ideal times um, to change or retrofit an existing property are when you're rebuilding from an ordinary incident, possibly a house fire or post-disaster after a windstorm event, you really have an opportunity to get in there and do some things differently. As far as, and, and let me just say this, our major focus is helping consumers make informed choices at the market level. What the developers and the builders that we work with every day tell us is if it's a level playing field and it's either in the building code or everybody wants it and the customer wants it, it will happen. And, and what we've seen in places where the model codes have been enacted is that the cost of doing the wind um, mitigation techniques at the point of new construction go down because the marketplace for shutter options or impact windows or all the different things, it's the, the scale introduces a lot of savings. And over time, it becomes less expensive, say, to buy shutters in Miami where they're required than it is possibly up on the coast of, you know, St. Simon. So there's, because there's more options in the marketplace. And what the builders always tell us is this, if, if everybody has to do it, it's not going to adversely impact me. And that's where, you know, having it in the code over time is helpful. But on retrofitting, I think one example to look at, because of the number of homes that have been done, there's approximately 20,000 homes that have been completed through the My Safe Florida Home Program, and their average expenditure by the homeowner, and it is matched by a matching grant, is around $3,100. So if a homeowner goes in and says, I want to shutter, replace my garage door with an impact-resistant door, and if I can get attic access, install some um, retrofit hurricane straps to keep the roof and the wall connected, that's around 3,100 expenditure on their part, and it's matched by another 3,100. So it's about 6,200 if they want to make the investment. Now, to the point on insurance, in those same markets, they have some of the highest insurance rates in the country. So on the wind portion of the insurance, in those markets, especially in southeast Florida, they can save up to 52% on the wind premium. So there are substantial every year savings on the insurance that follow the investment and mitigation. And, and pretty in pretty short time, it pays for itself. When we look at all of it, though, what we find is the financial incentives are essential as a support. But I think what really helps people, you know, decide to either buy or retrofit or build differently is when they think about the safety aspect. Um, just kind of putting themselves in the place of the people who went through Katrina or any of the, you know, tornado outcomes, you know, they, they, they envision what they could do differently ahead of time. That's the most powerful motivator of, of all. You know, one of the, the, you know, especially relevant to the experience that both of you have had in your districts, you know, with tornado, the, the thing that's sad, I think, in this country is that most homeowners and many builders don't even know that there is a tornado safe room that you can affordably construct either retrofit or new construction in homes. And that's a life safety bunker. That's not really about the house. That's about the survival of the family. And the, and the cost of constructing those has come way down over time as well. That's what we'd like to do is, as long as people know ahead of time and can make that decision, to us that's the key. Gentlemen's time is, 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 has expired. and. Uh, Next, the gentlelady from California, uh, Ms. Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, let me applaud uh, your leadership in, in having this hearing today. Uh, given uh, what has just happened in the last couple days, it's quite timely. Um, my first question is for Dr. Levington. Uh, could you please discuss with us the lack of federal funding for wind engineering research um, effects? And Excuse me, I'm sorry. Could you discuss for us the lack of federal funding for the wind engineering research and how it affects the pipeline of students interested in pursuing wind engineering or disaster-related engineering as a career? And a follow-up to that is, uh, what impact do you see of the lack of students participating will that have on our future in terms of building safety? Uh, yeah, thank you. That's uh, uh, an excellent 
um, question that that's a, a key part of the part of the problem. Well, we have is, great staff. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, uh, or the professor in me comes out sometimes. Uh -huh. uh, the um, there's really comparatively few faculty that, that work uh, in the area of wind hazard research, and that's. 100% correlated to funding. Faculty have to get promoted and tenured, and how do they do that? They get funded to do research. They have, have research funding, so they have to support their students, et cetera. And so the, the, at the beginning of the chain is sort of if, if there's no university research being done, then there's very few faculty that work and have any expertise in that area. And certainly experimental work is expensive, and, uh, and little, so it's difficult to do uh, a, a lot of kinds of things without experimental facilities. And, uh, and, and so that leads then to the chain of very few graduate students and undergraduates working in the laboratories, et cetera, uh, moving along. And, and so that, that filters out that you have few people with any expertise that get out of school. Actually, we have the problem is there's not many much in the way of curricular materials for compared to earthquake, where, which has had the, 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 the funding in, in recent years. There's textbooks. There's books out there. In California, there, most of the schools and their undergraduate programs either have specific courses in earthquake engineering, or they incorporate a major component of that into their sort of their senior design courses. And we don't do that for, for, for wind and, and, and hurricane. Um, there, there's very little information out there because the, the, the chain really never gets started because that's where it starts is, 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 is at the top, as you pointed out, with the university research. And then it get, gets filtered down and, and, and into practice. And when you don't have that and you don't have the core of faculty and graduate students working on that, it, uh, uh, you, you just don't have the, 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 trained work for, the trained workforce then. Might I suggest that maybe you put together um, some recommendations for this committee as well as the administration of what we should be thinking about in the upcoming years of how we can ensure that we're developing a pool of folks, uh, whatever it might be and whatever level that you recommend, uh, that we begin to address so that that way we can appropriately ensure that we do have uh, people who can make uh, these 21st century recommendations to improve our safety. Yes, I'd be very glad to. There is a few a few programs out there uh, at uh, my alma mater and my colleagues from Texas Tech have a wind science and engineering PhD program and they were funded by the National Science Foundation through their IGERT, their Integrative Graduate Education Research and Training Program to, to build that a very unique and innovative. Uh, we received a grant from the National Science Foundation to um, uh, build uh, some curriculum materials for hurricane engineering, the first, uh, really the first program uh, of its kind in, in the country. And so there is some uh, fledgling programs, but that to, for those to be expanded, I'd be glad to provide those recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. And then my next question is for Dr. Hayes. Uh, this weekend I had the opportunity to travel on a congressional uh, delegation to New Orleans in Mississippi and Baton Rouge, and we saw some of the results still, uh, now three years it's going to be the anniversary of that very devastating uh, hurricanes of uh, Katrina and both Rita. Uh, can you tell me in your mind, do you feel that um, based upon the work that your organization has done, have insurance companies appropriately uh, taken into effect uh, what your recommendations are, and do you find that the policies are now reflective to, in fact, protect our consumers? Um, I, I'm not sure that um, that I am the best person to speak to insurance policies. Um, that really takes us, I think, sort of outside of the S&T domain that, that I'm most familiar with in our office. Um, well, let is, me is clarify my question, and I've got about 30 seconds, so I'm going to be as brief as I can. Um, it's my understanding that uh, folks were sent with FEMA, NIST, and NSF uh, down to, you know, assist and coordinate with the efforts. Um, some of the problems that have been said about Hurricane Katrina and Rita was that the policies that people had were not consistent with understanding potentially what damage could have occurred. And so my question is, from what you've learned and what these various organizations have observed, um, have those indicators been passed on to the appropriate folks who can and then assist our consumers to ensure that they, in fact, have the right protections. Okay, so I, I, I think the answer is that that's happening. It's, it's a process that's still um, ongoing. There's, there's a saying in this field that, um, that we, um, we are always prepared for the last storm. Um, and that is in part because we learn so much from each event as it happens. So as you mentioned, all these different teams um, combined government and private sector researchers down there learning from Hurricane Katrina. 
number of different agencies have, um, have participated in that. Um, some of those results are, are starting to, to come online, so to speak, but um, I, I think that's very much an evolving process, and so we need to look to the future to see the uptake of what we learned from that, that event. Thank you very much. And you were very kind, uh, Mr. Chairman, to allow me that additional 30 seconds. I thank the gentlelady, and the gentleman from Michigan is uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, first of all, I, I was amused by your comment about the Habitat for Humanity homes. Uh, I was not at all surprised at the, uh, when I saw that uh, scorecard years ago. Is I've worked on Habitat for Humanity homes, and I'm from the old school. If one nail is good, two is better. But I remember particularly working on one house where I was joining the roof to the wall. And I'm sure if that roof is ever blown off, the wall will, be, will go with it. <laughs> uh, now, maybe in the, that's not an efficient way to do things, but it certainly saves a lot of trouble later. Um, Dr. Hayes, I... Uh, you said in your testimony that the benefits of this improved understanding will not be fully realized, however, until it is incorporated more completely into actions at the state and local level, both through building codes, design standards, and construction practices, with which I fully agree. But what, what plans does the interagency uh, working group have to do with that? And I have a follow-up uh, question relating to NIST and NSF. You'd answer that first one. So the, the issue of uptake at, at the local level, um, I, I think, is one that goes beyond just the, the science and technology. I mean, certainly there are mm -hmm. market mechanisms that can be brought to bear um, to encourage uptake, incentive programs, and, and so forth that, that I think sort of go well outside the, the, the S&T arena that, that we're mostly talking about here. Um, in terms of what the agencies can do, though, I, I, I think there's, there's sort of a two-step process. Um, once the research is done, we understand um, what the, the science and engineering results are telling us. Um, that first step, and I know you're very familiar with this, is um, the translation of that into um, standards and so forth. And so these consensus-based standards organizations um, that NIST is very much in, engaged in, for example. Um, are a place where the federal government, I think, does a good job of, of helping to, um, to transfer knowledge. Um, where I, I think there, there remains to be a lot of work to be done is the, that um, second step, which is the transfer of those standards that are developed um, by the engineers, by the scientists at the local level. Um, and um, it, that's something that, that I think the, the federal agencies in this program tend not to be as engaged in because their emphasis is on the science and technology, um, but certainly one that, that I'd be interested in learning more about as, as you've highlighted a very important um, problem in, in the overall. Another aspect of this, I was struck in listening to the comments back and forth. It, uh, this is a, a building practices type of thing, and I would not expect NSF to be active in it. And I was surprised by the number of times people related work done by the National Science Foundation. I don't think any of my colleagues are aware of that and the importance of that work. Similarly, the comments about NIST a number of times over. And we fail in the Congress to, to adequately fund these research organizations Many members, I think, believe it's pie in the sky, pure science, but it has direct applications. And I would hope that um, you would continue to work with those of us in the Congress, particularly this committee. I know Mr. Wu and Dr. Gingrey feel very strongly about this, just as I do, that we are not adequately funding our research institutions. I would hope that your agency would join with us in that effort uh, to persuade the rest of our colleagues to do it right. And since uh, the, the president will be leaving office shortly, you can throw discretion to the winds and request mammoth amounts of, of money for these agencies in next year's budget, even though it may not last, but at least it'll be a good, a good show for the next administration to deal with. Well, Mr. Ehlers, you've mentioned two agencies that, of course, are within the American Competitiveness Initiative. So right. um, I feel very comfortable in saying that, that we agree with you that those are two agencies that, that do need additional funding. And we're hoping that, that the appropriations process will yield that this year. Right. I thank you for all uh, 
your work that, that you and Dr. Marburger did on the Competes Act, and uh, especially that the President endorsed it so strongly. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. And uh, I, I just want to uh, uh, make a comment before uh, closing. Um, and it is in part Dr. Hayes' uh, re response to um, what I'm reading between the lines and some of the testimony that you gave and also uh, the answers that you gave to some of the questions uh, and some of the colloquy uh, with Dr. Ehlers. Uh, and, and that is that uh, you seem to be advocating uh, for an all hazards approach um, uh, uh, rather than uh, this uh, wind hazard uh, program which has not received, it seems to me, either adequate attention or adequate funding. Um, and I, I want to point out that it has been set, cited several times, uh, both by the witnesses and by Dr. Ehlers, uh, that the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program uh, at NIST uh, is a success by many metrics, uh, that earthquake codes uh, have responded uh, or have been changed uh, all around the country. Uh, and um, I will take into consideration what you have, have had to say about taking an all hazards approach, but I do want to point out that this authorizing legislation passed in 2004 uh, was bipartisan in its original sponsorship, uh, was bipartisan, was passed in a bipartisan manner through both chambers of this Congress and was signed by President Bush, and it is uh, the law of the land. And uh, if this Congress uh, uh, passes the legislation again, um, I, I believe that, uh, uh, there, that what the witnesses have brought to light today um, and um, uh, the concerns of the members of this subcommittee are that uh, whatever reauthorizing legislation we pass, uh, be implemented uh, with with heart and with resources uh, and, and, and with thoughtfulness. I know that we all work hard uh, to serve this nation well. Um, and uh, uh, as we move forward uh, in any reauthorization, uh, we do want um, the future uh, to be an improvement uh, on what has happened between 2004 and now with respect to this program. I, I, I want to thank all of our witnesses for coming the distance uh, and testifying today. I appreciate that uh, uh, very, very much. And I understand that you know, one of our witnesses uh, uh, was uh, unavoidably detained, uh, as I have been numerous times uh, in Chicago. Um, and uh, uh, it's the uh, Bermuda Triangle, a com commercial flight. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that that is a problem that we'll work on and, and, and solve uh, eventually also. Um, the record will remain open uh, for additional statements uh, from members and for answers to any follow-up questions the committee uh, may ask of the witnesses. And with that, uh, I again thank all the witnesses, uh, thank the members for their participation, and uh, the witnesses are excused, and the hearing is now adjourned.